Hello, my name is Joan. In this course, I'm going to take you through how to create photogrammetry models for films, TV, and games. If you find this helpful, please like and subscribe and hit that bell for more videos. And don't forget to check out my website, 3dassetlibrary.com, for Unreal and Unity Engine assets. Also, if you find this helpful, please check out my Patreon below for exclusive content relating to photogrammetry, games. So, before we start the section, I thought I'd just make people aware that um, I have repeated videos two, four, and five from section three in this. Um, I thought I'd just put it in here in case people have skipped that section straight to this section or people want to remember um, exactly uh, how the process works. My advice would be follow this along because uh, it's not exactly um, a long section this and um, it helps it get stuck in your mind. Um, the, the primary ones we want to look at is um, uh, setting up the turntable and then taking the photos uh, for this section because they're they're slightly different from uh, the previous section so I thought I'd just mention that just in case so in our previous section section three we talked about how to set up um, a turntable how to create a 3d mesh from images etc um, but what that does is that just gives you your bog standard photogrammetry type scan where it's missing the bottom of the object now what I'm going to show you here is how to create a full 360 degree scan of an object. Now bear in mind obviously you can't really apply this to things like cars unless you can flip the car over or put it in the sky, hang it from a crane or something like that. So always bear that in mind. Um, it depends on your object a lot. It's obviously you can't flip a tree over and things like that. So what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you how I 3D scan um, 360 degree items. Now I said I was going to use a hammer, the hammer from the previous tutorial, but I decided to move to a boot because I thought it has a little bit more um, detail and it's a bit more interesting rather than going over the same thing again. And I want to try and keep this interesting for people. So in the original turntable, I showed you I had this turntable and the salad tape is there for a reason. I'll tell you why in a minute. A uh, turntable and it had squiggles all over it. Now this is exactly the same turntable from section three. It's got all the marks on, but what I've done is I've covered the top in just white paper. And the reason is, is I want this to blend into the background. Now in an ideal world, um, this should all be white. For me, I've not really run into any issues with this being black, but if you want to be perfect about it, you can obviously make this all white, you could spray it white, you could do whatever, you can make the even the the um the circle board, you could put some board on it that's a white board like foam, foam X, I believe it is, um fiber board, something like that, over the, so it's bigger, so it's not showing this. Now we've got exactly the same um little one inch gaps here. And um now the the salad tape, uh, this was found out purely by accident. I needed to prop my item up on something to be able to do these scans. Now I found that the Salatape, because it's reflective, is incredibly handy for 3D scanning stuff. Because A, it helps with shadow, because the um, the shadow, because of it being in the light box, the shadow of uh, that's cast from the, the boot, for instance, um, is a lot less when using, um, so if we look here, we're getting a lot less shadow. This is a little bit paler um, than, I say, the boot being closer, where it'd be very dark. And this obviously helps for the scan. But what happens is when we're scanning, um, a, it gets it off the ground, so when, when we're doing our full 360 um, photos, um, it really helps. But what it is, is, because it's reflective, the software doesn't really pick up any of the salotape reel at all. Now, this is purely found by accident, and um, you know you could come up with a fancier way if that's what you want to do, but I found this works incredibly well for me, and I'm trying to do it on stuff that doesn't cost a lot of money. So that's um, how our table's set up. So we want, as I say, just a clean bit of uh, paper here. Um, doesn't have to be immaculate, but a clean bit of paper. And um, these will then uh, help generate our masks, which we will discuss in uh, uh, setting up photos and things like that. So in this part, I'm going to show you how to set up your camera and the settings uh, that you need to know in it. Obviously, you're going to have to look into your camera or your camera phone to find out what where the settings are kept because there's no possible way obviously I can know where every single camera settings are kept but generally if you type in like um, ISO, Sony, HX60 camera or something like that you'll you'll get the exactly where the, the uh, tutorial and exactly where the ISO is and how to get to it um, but predominantly I'm using a phone on this well no the entire course I am using a phone on this so obviously this is I'm going off of a phone here um, but the same principles apply to a camera um, except you have more control over things like aperture and things like that so but I will mention that um, wh where applicable like um, the aperture setting in here what, what that should be etc so first of all on your phone or your camera you want to be in the pro mode or manual modes you don't want to be using any automatic modes because it can it messes with your lighting etc when it's trying to take a photo um, 
for the white balance you want to set it um for the best way to i, I look at it is that is you look at what you're photographing and try and match it on the camera um, if you're obviously under incandescent lighting, generally, like on my mobile phone, you have a setting for incandescent lighting so that it'll automatically adjust that so that you can look at it and go, yeah, right, that's spot on. So the white should look like whites on the camera. It shouldn't look cream. It shouldn't look dark. It shouldn't look anything like that. Um, the focus I on mine, I put it onto automatic. And then what I do is I lock the focus. I'll get the area that I want in focus on the uh, screen. And then I'll lock the focus manually. Now on my phone, I hold down to lock the focus manually. I believe on Samsung's it's the same principle. Um, cameras, I know on my Sony that you can lock the focus to just a section. Um, so, yep, that's that. Um, the ISO, I, from what I understand, you best have the ISO as low as possible. Um, I have mine set to 50. That works absolutely spot on for me. Um, and then on a camera, you want um, your uh, aperture on a, on a proper DSLR camera, you want your aperture at about eight, eight-ish, maybe eight to 10. Um, so this gets a lot more of your image in focus. Obviously the photos take a lot more time to pro process when clicking, so bear that in mind. Um, right, so that's that. Um, one important thing is, and this is very important, is to avoid zooming. Um, you don't want to be zooming in on your object. You want to keep your lens always um, as fully zoomed in or out, is that right? Fully zoomed in as possible. And um, uh, you don't want to be zooming in and out because this can cause all sorts of problems for the depth uh, perception and the depth maps inside of uh, 3D scanning. Um, so if your object is too far away, move your object closer. It's as simple as that. Um, uh, camera tripod, we will be using uh, sort of, generally I use three different heights. Um, one that's looking down on the object one that's, I would say, about a third of the way down the object, and then one that's about two thirds of the way down the object. Um, obviously, this can vary depending on the object you're scanning. Um, sometimes I'll just get away with two, sometimes even one um, position on the tripod. There isn't really any fixed way of doing this. You know, you'll see from my photos how I've done it. Um, if you look here at the flower, it's um, uh, got a top down there and then gradually as we scroll down um, you can see it's dropped down to the side here and um, we've gone underneath here um, so there's there's no fixed way but they, for say for scanning shoes that might be slightly different layout so it's best f you'll learn very quickly what works what doesn't work how much detail do you want to get on the object things like that so the tripods really down to you there's no fixed way of doing things although i'm just gonna i would follow where you can what i've done because it works spot on for me so let's move on to the next bit so when doing a 360 degree scan and taking the photos it's slightly different than the previous section in there obviously we want to be trying to get as much of the object um, upside down left right backwards forwards etc um, on pictures so how this initially works is that you'll see here that I've got my first picture. So these are included. So the first picture is this, and this is our first mask. So you'll notice here that when I put my, my boot on, I've got my boot here, and I've lined that up, I've set up, got all the focusing on the camera, etc., and I've put the tripod um, in a sort of almost down, looking down a tiny bit position. Um, you can do this however you want. Um, I've just done two positions for this because I know it's going to work fine. You can do three positions, four positions, etc. The more positions, you know, it can often create a better quality image. Um, but what I wanted to do is try and keep um, it friendly for your computers because I'm not sure, obviously, the specs of everyone's computers is following this. But you'll notice here that so I've got the boot in focus and then what I did is I made sure that when I spun the boot around that the um, the toe is in the camera and it, which it is and um, because what happened is that if if some of the pictures don't include the whole object you'll you might get say missing the whole of the toe for instance which we don't want and then what I did is so I'll go back to our first one here is that I took the boot off and I took this as my first photo so this has to be your first photo and this is your mask and you'll see why in a minute um, you can you can take this photo whenever you want, but I was I would advise taking it as your first photo. So then what we did, or what I did, is I moved along doing my usual scan. So I've gone around, done my full 360 on me, little notches, as you can see, and then gone for the full 360. Now what I did is I turned the boot over on its side, keeping exactly the same camera position, exactly the same focus locked, etc., and I carried on. 
So as you can see there, off I went. I've got a bit of mud on the on the shoe there, I believe. Yep. Yeah. And um, then I did exactly the same, but I flipped the boot again, so the opposite direction. So what this does is this allows the software to properly sync up all of these parts um, in 360. So then when we get to the end here, what will happen is I will, I've moved the tripod position down and I've created another mask. So it's exactly the same principle here that I've got my boot in position, etc., and um, I've created another mask. What you'll notice though is I've left the boot in exactly the same position or not exactly the same, but the exact, you know, near enough the same position as the previous photo, boot photo I took. And I found that this just helps the software sync it up for whatever reason. I don't know whether that's just, you know, pure luck in my case, or whether it is a tried and true method, but for me, it seems to work. And so what I've done then is I've gone in, almost in, gone backwards. So I've, I've, you'll see what I mean. So I've gone my full 360 degree, then I'll flip it over again, full 360 degree, and then I'll put it up right and a full 360 degree. So the, I'd say the important things here are obviously you want to get as many photos of the image in all these angles. And you want the, when I get there, oh, me, where's it gone? You want to make sure that you have your masks, which are important because they allow to the software to basically cut out our boot and help it process a 360 degree. Now, one of the issues you'll get with things like, say, this shoe um, is obviously the software can't, really look in here, you'll see that I've stuffed this with a sock. Um, I've stuffed it with a sock because it puffs the, the shoe out more so you don't get dents in it and things like that. Obviously something like these leather boots, not necessarily a problem, but you might, with your trainer, it might look a bit flat. So if you, if you stuff them sh with a shirt or socks or something like that, that's great. You could even stuff it with a colored item here so that it makes it pop out more. For me, it's not a problem because when this scans, it's gonna leave a hole anyway. So it's not really an issue and um, you can fill this hole if you want or leave it, it's really up to you. So what we'll do is once we've taken our photos, as you can see here, we then will um, go through the next process of removing blurry photos or um, out of focus, focus photos if you've got any and then we'll import them in. Right, the next step is we want to import our photos onto our computer and that can vary depending on your, whether you're using a phone or a camera. Um, if you're stuck on what to do, either message me and I'll try my best to help or um, look online at the model of your camera slash phone and how do you import in generally it's you know nine times out of ten it's just plug it in and off you go and drag you know you drag them onto your, into your folder and um, give your folder a good name so in this case we'd name our folder hammer and um, it just keeps everything organized then there's two things we want to look for the first thing is we want to look for um, if any of our images are blurry. If you've got the odd image that's blurry, delete them. But if you've got a lot of images that are blurry, you want to look at the settings on your camera to make sure you don't have autofocus on or make sure that you're correctly um, focused on the, you know, the correct object in your scene. Um, because in an ideal world, you want to get it right the first time with the source footage, the source photos. You don't want to be trying to fix it in a software. You know, it's one of those things. Get it right first if you can. You know, it's one of those things. So um, we also want to check the difference between backgrounds. You know, we don't want to go from something like a really light background like this to, you know, our next picture's really dark and then our next picture's in between. Um, we want everything to be, if you look at here, the lighting is consistent all the time. No matter what we click on, it never changes. Um, so we want to make sure, again, our lighting is spot on. And if, if you've got the old photo that's dark, delete. Um, again, if you've got the option to retake the photos, if you've got loads of photos that are dark, because it means the settings on your camera, like the AIR, um, ISO, isn't probably right, uh, or your white balance, things like that. Um, and if you don't have that option, you can bring them into programs like Lightroom or Photoshop and adjust the brightness on your photos as a last resort. But my, my thing is get the photos right the first time rather than going in and then editing and all of that you know just just why you save yourself a lot of time so once we've done that we'll move on to importing them